I've been ordered by Colonel Casey to keep this short, so I'll attempt to do so. Uh, we're really honored tonight to have uh, Colonel Retired Cole Kingsey come down and talk to us. Uh, I've known Cole for a long time, and I had the honor and privilege to work with him at West Point for, for many years back in the 1990s, uh, teaching cadets and also mentoring the young officers who came through there as instructors. Cole has, has commanded at every level up through battalion. He's also been a brigade XO. Uh, He's been, uh, he's, he's an accomplished author. He has done, I think, the most book reviews of any human being in history. Uh, he's, uh, he's done a number of books on, uh, on leadership and on World War II. Uh, the one thing I remember most about him that I think is relevant, especially for all you war college students out there, is Cole is the best mentor of Army officers I've ever seen. When, when we were at West Point, he was uh, ran the military history division there on the history department. He paid as much attention to his officers for their development as he did with, did with his cadets. So he always used to talk about that we graduated two classes every year from the history department. One were the cadets that we got to graduate, the other were the officers that we sent out to the field, uh, back to the soldiers. And uh, he did a lot of of, uh, for my career as well, helped develop me. I understand he actually is, is responsible for whatever good Frank Hancock is capable of doing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, Dick, is, uh, his latest project, in between all the staff rides he leads to Gettysburg and Normandy and, and, and around the world, has been the, uh, uh, the memoirs of Dick Winters. Uh, so many of us have know Dick and know Dick. And, and uh, it's an inspiring story. It's a informative story for those of us in the military profession, and there is no one I know who's been prepared to tell that story than Nicole Casey. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming out tonight. Uh, I know the weather has really cooperated. Uh, you know, under ordinary circumstances, I, I'd be very humbled by the size of the audience. But, uh, but I honestly realize you're here not to hear me, but to hear about Dick Winters. Now I'll tell you what, he's, uh, I see uh, Major Winters about once a month. Uh, and probably next to my father, he's a man I whom I most admire, uh, that I've known. I'm, uh, I'm fascinated, absolutely fascinated by the continued popularity of the band The Brothers. Whether we're talking about Stephen Ambrose with the, with the book, whether you're talking about the HBO miniseries, as many of you know, uh, this May, there are going to be two more books out written by Easy Company veterans. Infantry Magazine most recently said that, uh, you know, the study of uh, Easy Company and major winners is really a primer on military leadership. What I'd like to do tonight is very briefly, uh, you know, kind of go over the key events in a major winner's career and maybe give you a little bit of insights, things that you did not see in the miniseries or from, uh, from Band of Brothers. Second part, I'd like to talk a little bit about my association with Major Winters, how it all came about, and finally just some general observations. And we'll do all this for uh, probably go around 8 o'clock and then open it for uh, uh, questions. Uh, first things first, and the most important thing, Major Winters is alive and well in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Just last month he celebrated his 90th birthday. He's, um, he's pretty well confined to the house now in Hershey, uh, and he's really kind of enjoying the, the peace and quiet that he promised himself if he survived D-Day and all that. But again, still doing pretty well, and all things considering, uh, mentally extremely alert, uh, still has a very wry sense of humor, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we, uh, as we go over tonight. You know, as I take a look back upon the time uh, when we uh, first met Major Winters, uh, and it's almost a family affair. Uh, he lets, um, I'll, I'll take the beginning before I go over some of the things in his career, he lets very few people into his inner circle. And, uh, and, and I think there are a number of reasons uh, for that, and I'll try to open, uh, answer the questions very, very openly uh, tonight. Anything uh, that I do say is certainly on the record. Uh, he, uh, I talked to him about, uh, you know, coming down here and he doesn't have any problems. Uh, with anything that, uh, that I'm going to say. He's, um, he's a very strange individual to get to know. Uh, I learned very early on, 
um, that he let a few people into a circle. So what I ended up doing, I was not, uh, I wasn't, uh, this wasn't beneath me. I used my daughter to, uh, to kind of get into his inner circle. My daughter now is a junior at, uh, here at Ohio State. But what we used to end up doing, my mom and dad uh, still live in western Ohio. And over every Thanksgiving when my daughter was in elementary school and in uh, high school, we used to go home to the farm in Ohio over Thanksgiving holiday. And what we would end up doing after that, on Thursday, we'd drive back uh, to the military academy where uh, Conrad and I were stationed. Well, it was the, uh, Dick does not have a granddaughter of his own. He kind of adopted uh, my daughter, Maura. And what really got me in, in, into the good side of the boy, Matt and I, and, and I did not ask her to do this, uh, first of all. She told Major Winters one time, she goes, to the, it's always Major Winters. Uh, uh, she would not dream of calling him by his, uh, by his first name. She went up to him, she goes, you know, Major Winters, if anything happens to my dad or to my brother or to my grandpa, I want you to walk me down the aisle. And that's all. He just kind of melted into her tank. So all of a sudden, I, 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 I was kind of in the inner circle. But I'll tell you a lot more about that and, and uh, actually some of the, the more humorous things that happened. I think most of you know a lot about the story of uh, Major Winters. No one ever heard of it until, uh, you know, uh, Band of Brothers was published in 1992. And Stephen Ambrose, when he wrote that book, he did it really as a, a filler. Ambrose had probably... About five or six of, of his favorites. Major Winters was uh, one of those. Another man that uh, would be greatly admired was Captain Joe Dawson of the 1st Infantry Division, whom Ambrose alleges was the first uh, infantry company commander to be able to pull his, uh, his company on the bluffs above Omaha Beach. You know, I don't know if he was the first or the second or the third, and it really doesn't make any difference which one it was. Another one of his favorites was uh, Bud Lomel, who lives in Tom's River. New Jersey. Uh, Lomel was one of the rangers who scaled uh, heights uh, at Point Daw, and he is the one who personally destroyed those guns. Lyle Bach, uh, at the time, was a 20-year-old uh, uh, platoon leader for Intelligence and Reconnaissance Platoon, whose platoon happened to be standing right in the path of the German advance uh, on, uh, on December 16, 1944. But Ambrose used to have uh, these people, and generally any time when he would do uh, these various symposia and these conferences on the 50th anniversary of World War II, he would always have these select folks there. By the time I got to uh, the military academy, one thing that I had learned uh, uh, throughout my career, I learned how to dip into the dean's money. The dean of West Point, they never had enough money for anything, so I learned a long time ago I always asked for twice as much money as I wanted. And of course, it always comes down, they always slash it about 50%. But I always have enough of this to go to attend these various conferences with Ambrose. And that's how I got to meet all these guys. And one of them was uh, Dick Winters. Uh, as many of you know, he was born in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in January of 1918. Um, graduated from Franklin and Marshall. Uh, he, he was a small town boy, and still is, and you can see that just when you, if any of you have been to Hershey, it's very much still, you know, the old company town, small town uh, America. Last thing he wanted to do in uh, 1941 was to go into the military service. He enlisted strictly to get out of the draft. He would serve there for uh, one year, and of course in, the, in, that, in that year he had the Japanese attack at, uh, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, he was in the infantry. You know, he could have been in anything. He didn't care less because he wasn't planning to spend the time in the service. But obviously when the war came, he realized he was going to be in it for the duration. And that's really when he, uh, and he had been down at, uh, at Fort Benning, uh, Georgia, and going through uh, OCS. They tried to recruit him uh, for an armor branch to go to Fort Knox, but he wanted to go to the infantry. And while he was at OCS, was his real first encounter with the Airborne. And he's told many of them, if you talk to any of those uh, easy company veterans, they wanted to be with the best. I tell you what, his, his, uh, his perspective of the Army in 1941, Major Winters, was not very, very odd. Same thing that Joe Dawson used to tell me. Uh, this was, uh, it, it was pretty sad there uh, at the beginning of 1941. But he wanted to go uh, in that. Most of you are familiar, uh, obviously, from, uh, from the series, the problems he encountered at Camp Tacoa with, uh, with Captain Soule. 
you know, virtually anybody in here, in fact, we were talking about some of this, and uh, Frank Hancock and I were reminiscing about some of the days we had back with the, uh, in the 25th Division in Hawaii with some of the senior officers. And of course, when you're a junior officer, you're looking up, you have an entirely different perspective. But most of us in the military, at some time or place, has encountered a problem with a senior officer. And that's exactly what they had with uh, Sol. Um, you know, I think a whole lot of the way David Schwimmer portrayed him at the beginning, because I couldn't get over the fact that this is Ross talking uh, you know, <laughs> from friendly. Yeah, I couldn't make that transition. Now I'm going to back on it. Uh, it, it it's, I think it's very, very good. An interesting, uh, you know, story about that. Uh, uh, Megan Winters was talking to his daughter, and they were going through, this was a couple of years ago, they were going through a couple of old boxes upstairs and everything else, and there was that one portrait of Captain Sol. And, uh, and someone had drawn a different mustache on him. <laughs> I've been in the Army for 30 years, and many of you, you, you have been there. You know, at times you could have mustaches in the Army, you couldn't have it, you know, it couldn't be below here, and all this kind of stuff. No matter what you have, you can't have a Hitler mustache. Nobody in the Western world today is allowed to have a Hitler mustache. They got ruined forever. His daughter was offended. She goes, who would do such a thing to the commanding officer? Major Winters got real close to her, about one inch away from her face, and goes, I did. And that kind of tells you, that kind of tells you what they thought about this guy. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking to him about Captain Soul. Oddly enough, one of my times in Normandy, when it was all over, when I was taking, uh, there was a corporate group through there, a guy came up to me and goes, uh, Herbert Sobel was my uncle. We knew him as Uncle Herb, kind of the, the st storybook uh, uncle, and no one had really thought of anything like that. Obviously, though, the officers and the men of EC Company had a problem. They respected him on account that he was a disciplinarian. The problem that most of the officers had with him and is from their perspective, from the perspective of the junior officer, he led by fear and not by example. And most times, I think, when something like that happens, uh, the leaders throughout the organization have a tendency to band together. And I think that's what happened with Easy Company. And the, and the soldiers, the rank and file then, rallied around the platoon commanders rather than the company commander. And they considered themselves, uh, at that time, really more as members of 2nd Platoon, 1st Platoon, than they did of Easy Company. It's very easy to kind of fall into the thing of Easy Company now, of course, about the miniseries and everything else. But that all came much, much later. They rallied around the lieutenants rather than the company commander. The closer, uh, they obviously deployed uh, to England in September of uh, 1943. Uh, and if you remember from the very first episode there in Band of Brothers, when the, when the confrontation between uh, Captain Sobel and Lieutenant Winters, there is, and he's offered the Article 15 and he decides to take the court martial. That occurs almost immediately <coughs> upon their arrival in England. They deployed uh, in September, and this thing came to a head in early November. So it's not that they had been training in, uh, in England for two, three, uh, five months or so prior to D-Day. And of course, what then forced uh, the, the, uh, the regimental commander and the battalion commander to address that issue. And what really happened, and it, and it comes a little bit, you can see it as, uh, I think, uh, they have Bill Gardner talking about it. The closer and closer they got to D-Day, and particularly they understood the fact that now that they were in England, not knowing when D-Day would be, the more and more they were fearful of Captain Sobel leading that company. And that's really what happened. Winters was aware that there was a lot of talk going on. Now, he did not think that they were going to submit their uh, resignation or anything else. In fact, indeed, he tried to talk them out of, out of it. Because he, but he was very much on the outside when all this, uh, this came. He was moved to headquarters company. He considered it a demotion, needless to say, that now he was a regimental mess officer. This is a guy who had been a platoon commander, and the last thing he wanted to do was to uh, leave the rank and file. But that's really kind of what happened. And obviously, when any time that happens in the company, if you relieve the company commander, then a the battalion commander and a regimental commander could hardly put one of the reasons, the exec, to move him up to now making the easy company commanders, because of course he was the subject, uh, you know, of the court martial and everything else. 
But later on, he, uh, he uh, assigns them back into EC Company about a month or two prior uh, to D-Day. One thing that, uh, that amazed me in the, in the many years I was talking about uh, major winners, uh, you, you, you all know, obviously, the story of Brayport Manor, the, you know, the jump in uh, on, uh, on D-Day, the first combat uh, there, taking out that German battery. Brayport Manor was and still is very special to major winners. Everything else he did in the war, whether you're talking about Bastogne or whether you're talking about the fighting in Holland, uh, you're talking about the end of the war, Berchus Garden, everything else, it is great for it that he always went back. My only regret, and I, and I expressed this to him on, on several occasions, I got to know uh, Major Winters, I'll tell you a little bit about it in a, in a while, dating back to 1997. My only regret is I never got a chance to accompany him when he went back to Great Corps Manor. When he did go back for the uh, world premiere of Band of Brothers in 2001, he agreed to go, but he told the, uh, he told the producers he was not going to have anything to do with the big parties in Paris and everything else. He would join them on Utah Beach, because that's where the world premiere was. But for the two or three days prior to that, he and Mrs. Winters went and they stayed in the chateau right there in Normandy. And every day, they would go back to that field. I've been to the manor on many, uh, many occasions. I'll be back there uh, next month. But he wanted to be by himself. Mrs. Winters stayed at the chateau and uh, Major Winters. And of course, now remember, at this time, you're talking about uh, someone almost in their mid-80s. And he would stay out literally hours at a time walking that very small field. And you can almost kind of uh, imagine the events of the past turning over and over in his head. But it was, it, it, it was and is special. When I was doing my work on Joe Dawson, I, I was taking a look at some of the papers of Terry Allen, who was the commander of the 1st Division. And, he, uh, and he'd been in combat uh, throughout uh, the Mediterranean and the European theaters. But uh, Operation Torch, the first combat, was always the most special. And what General Allen said, he said, he said because it was the first time that the 1st Division went into uh, combat. And that's the same thing it is with uh, Major Winters in Braveheart Manor. Uh, he felt that that time he had really stepped up and he had proven himself. He was very confident that he was a good leader. And, uh, and, and, he, and he wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't being boastful or anything else like that. He knew he was an effective leader, but he had to prove it. He had to prove it. He had to measure up uh, in the eyes of the men. And that's what he felt that he had done. And it really kind of validated uh, his uh, feelings on leadership and everything else. We'll kind of come back to that a little bit later on. Uh, we talked a lot of time about Holland, uh, the bayonet charge on the dike there on, uh, on October 5th. Uh, as many of you know that there, uh, there was a move a couple of years ago, and I guess it's been reintroduced in the House of Representatives, a bill to uh, award the Medal of Honor for major winners. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to it. I know uh, the first effort uh, did not meet uh, with success. It went all the way up to the uh, Secretary of the Army at the time. Uh, my, own, my own feeling is um, that probably the action on October 5th in Holland uh, not, not never earned the Medal of Honor, needless to say, but if there was an action uh, you know, that met the requirements, it was probably more that than it was in, uh, in Great Corps Manor. I found it absolutely fascinating that that was the last time that he had uh, fired his weapon uh, in combat. He thought it was a tremendous emotion when he was promoted uh, to move up to uh, be the battalion executive officer that. And you know, all the time we talk about Easy Company, if you take a look at the Band of Brother miniseries and everything else, uh, Major Winters was only the company commander just for four months. In fact, it was exactly four months. It really goes from D-Day until about October 5th. And like most of the, uh, us who, has, uh, who have commanded at various levels throughout our career, there's always, uh, it, it, it's hard to kind of let go and even that came out many times in the miniseries, even though he's an executive officer or the battalion commander, he still has that tie, that connection with Easy Company. He says it was a great mistake because he always had a tendency to rely on Easy Company and actually go back then because he knew that they could do the job. Uh, and, he, uh, and he regrets that to his day. Only mistake he made, I asked him one time, I said, what's the biggest mistake you made or did you make any? You're very upfront. He goes, I fell into a habit. 
always had uh, first platoon on the left and second platoon on the right, third platoon in reserve. And as a result of that, first and second platoon uh, sustained far more casualties than third platoon. And 50 years after the war, there were more veterans uh, uh, from the third platoon than the first two. He says, I just didn't think of it. He goes, I should have, but I just fell into a habit. Bastone, he's the executive officer, but, the, uh, but it depicts it fairly well that he is directing the operations for 2nd Battalion, even though he is the executive officer. Uh, Colonel Strayer at the time is, uh, uh, and, and, and don't get the idea that, that Colonel Strayer was like uh, Lieutenant Dyke is portrayed, but a lot of times uh, Colonel Strayer, who was the actual battalion commander, was working more at the regimental level, and that left to Major Winters uh, to actually operate uh, and direct the, uh, the movements of the battalion. Um, he took a great satisfaction in being the commander of the battalion. Uh, we brought it out in the book, you know, uh, even prior to D-Day, there's one thing he could not come because he's a very humble man. He's the most selfless man I've ever met. But one thing bothered him, and that was even prior to D-Day, he knew that he was a very effective leader. But everybody who had come into Easy Company, when I say everyone, I'm referring to the officers, had all been promoted. Um, and then been reassigned, some at the battalion level, some at the regimental level. And he couldn't understand it. And he wrote a letter back home, and in the letter, he identifies what he considers the problem. The letter was to a platonic uh, girlfriend whom he had met right when he uh, enlisted in the army. And he's writing and he goes, I can't understand why everybody else is getting promoted. He goes, I know I'm an effective leader. And what he attributed it to was the fact that he did not drink and he did not associate with the other officers at the officers club and everything else. And he was almost considered an outsider because he did not. We talked a lot about the uh, over dinner tonight, about the way the army was in the 60s and 70s and all that. How most of the uh, social events were all organized around alcohol. The Friday night at the officers club or the NCO club and everything else. We thought that was it. So he considered himself, he goes, in his words, I'm a half breed. I'm an officer, yes, but I'm an enlisted man at heart. And because he had that connection with the enlisted men, he was kind of uh, uh, scorned by the other officers. Now this is his uh, portrait. And what he talks about, he, he gives a wonderful, wonderful example of this. Is, is he, gives a, uh, he says, I want you to picture it is spring in England. It's wet and damp, because it's always wet and damp in England. And he goes, I want you to picture a soldier in a foxhole at a crossroads. It's about 4 o'clock in the morning. The soldier is freezing. He looks to the east, and just as the sun comes up, he sees an officer walking toward him. And he goes, who is it? And now in his letter, he goes to the third person. He goes, it's me. No other officer is up that early in the morning. And he says, and then I walk up to him, and he says, I, I literally knelt down on one knee, and of course the soldier's freezing and all this, and he says, the soldier took off his helmet, and like most soldiers do, they have a, a photograph of one of their, you know, their loved one in the helmet, and he shows a picture of his girlfriend, and he wants Lieutenant Winters to promise that he will see her again. Well, Lieutenant Winters obviously can't do that, uh, but he does promise them that he will do everything within his power that when the war is over, that he will get a chance to see her. And he does exactly that. After the war, uh, you know, they, they marry, they raise a family and everything else. But it kind of shows that, that personal touch, which is really kind of the foundation of, of his leadership. Uh, got a couple other things from the miniseries that I, that I want to kind of go over, uh, just some of the things uh, in the general observations with, uh, with Major Winters. Uh, there's a wonderful scene right at the very end there. It's a little bit misplaced, uh, but you remember when they're down at the airfield and, they're, and, the, and the German officer wants to address his men, and Captain Sobel comes kind of walk, walking by, and he walks right by Major Winters at this time, and Major Winters calls him back and he goes, Captain Sobel, 
You know, you salute the rank, not the man. That happened actually uh, before the Battle of the Bulls, but when they, when, they, when they did that, they put it at the end there because they thought that would just kind of you know, tie up very nicely, uh, you know, the way that it was. I had the opportunity to accompany Major Winters when he spoke to the FBI uh, at their headquarters, and the, and the director uh, at the time when Major Winters had finished speaking uh, ended his remarks uh, this way. He goes, uh, uh, most of us are familiar with the miniseries and that incident with Captain Sobel at the very end. And Major Winters told him that, uh, you know, you salute the rank, not the man. He goes, well, that doesn't cut it here in the FBI. In this case, we salute the man, not the rank. And it just seemed to be a very fitting uh, kind of thank you to Major Winters and his, uh, and his generation. Uh, Major Winters, a lot of people will always ask me about the scene that he had volunteered uh, to go to the Pacific Theater uh, after the war. He very much wanted to do it because he absolutely hated occupation duty. He said the Army had training, and too many of the soldiers were dying need uh, you know, needlessly around that uh, part. He did indeed have uh, an interview with the Commanding uh, General of the 13th uh, Airborne uh, Division. But what happened, or what he thinks happened, is that Colonel Saint, his regimental commander, had kind of prepped the battlefield and uh, asked the general to, uh, to go ahead and grant Major Winters an interview, but to decline his request to go to the... And that, that doesn't come out in the movie, but that's really kind of what happened. The Colonel Saint went up and asked the general, you know, give him the courtesy of an interview, but uh, under no circumstances can I afford to lose, you know, my battalion commander to go there. Uh, he had contemplated staying in the military, but it was just, a, in his words, there's a little bit too much uh, BS in the Occupation Army, and afterwards he wanted to get out. You know, when he did get that, he was released from active duty in January of 1946, and he put the war behind him. Never even talked about it for about another 40 years. My experience with the World War II veterans, and indeed we have several, uh, you know, of them here, um, that was not uncommon. My father never talked about Pearl Harbor until one time about 45 years after the war when he came out to visit me uh, in Hawaii. And I think what happened here is Ambrose really is the one who was most responsible for this. Uh, Ambrose at that time was uh, at the Eisenhower Center at the University of New Orleans, and that happened to be where the location was of the reunion of Easy Company. And again, he was looking for a filler. He had already written a book called Pegasus Bridge about a British uh, uh, company in the first action on D-Day. And he was ready in 1994 to release his, uh, his, his main work, D-Day. And he was looking for a filler. And he started talking to some of these veterans, and they talked about Easy Company. Major Winters happened to be there, so he thought he had already addressed some of the stuff on the, on the eastern flank of the invasion. This then would allow him to address an American Airborne Company on the western side of the invasion area. And that's really how uh, Band of Brothers uh, came about. Um, and that was in 1992. You know, the book was, it was a nice book. And that's all it was. You know, people turn out books every day. You know, we remember this, and obviously the size of the audiences here is based not on the book Band of Brothers, but on the miniseries. Because that, re that literally reached millions of people. The book reached thousands of people. But because of the many series and being rebroadcast on the History Channel, that's where it makes all the difference. That kind of leads me into my association with, uh, with major winners. And I'd like to uh, address that for about five to ten minutes, then just tie up with general observations and then open it up for uh, questions. I first met major winners in the spring of 1997. Uh, Conrad was, uh, was kind enough, far too kind, uh, when he talked about my relationship with some of the junior officers in the Department of History. But one thing I did try to encourage them to do was to invite the veterans from the previous wars to come and address the cadets at the Military Academy. At the time, every cadet had to take two semesters of military history, and each semester were 40 lessons. So what I tried to encourage the officers to do is take one of those lessons I think we probably had like 20 lessons in World War II. Take one of those lessons and bring a veteran back. And say, so you know what, that seems to be a no-brainer. If you can have somebody come back who landed at Omaha Beach, who reclined the coast of Point Dehaw, or uh, somebody who happened to be in Stalingrad, 
you ought to bring them because the cadets obviously they you know they saw they saw us far too much. Well, one day one of my officers, a guy by the name of Major Matt Dawson, came into my office and he goes, sir, he goes, uh, I'm taking you up on your uh, on your recommendation, and I've invited Major Winters into the uh, to come address the cadets. He goes, you know who Major Winters is, don't you? Never heard of the guy. <laughs> I absolutely never heard. Of it. I had read Band of Brothers years before, but you know the name, the name didn't register to me. But then he said, "You know the guy from Band of Brothers." But I felt ethically now I could uh, say that I didn't know who he was, so the colonel didn't seem to be too dumb when he was talking to me. I said, "Yeah, I know who he is. The guy from Band of Brothers." He goes, "That's right, sir." And he goes, "Would you like to join us for dinner?" I said, "Matt, I have never pulled rank on you, but I'm pulling right now." Yes, I want to join for dinner, but I want it just to be the two of us. He goes, sir, that's great. He's coming over to the house tomorrow night. This will give me an extra uh, evening with my wife and kids. So, you know, we met at, at the Thayer Hotel over dinner, just the two of us. Very first question, very first question he asked, have you read Dan and Brothers? And if the answer was no, <laughs> wouldn't have anything to do with it. That would be very pleasant, but, but that would be it. But that was really uh, to kind of get your foot in the door. In the, in, in the door. And you know, it went very well. Later on, I was going to go down to see him uh, in Hershey, and he had fallen. And he goes, I can tell you this, we have to, uh, we have to uh, put the visit off. He goes, you know, I'm in my uh, late 70s. Now, I don't recover as easily as I used to, so we're going to put it off. Well, his thing would happen. That fall, the next semester, 1997, a colleague of mine, who is now uh, in charge of Behavior Science and Leadership Department at West Point, had invited Major Winters to come back and to address the cadets. Well, I'm walking into halls, and I see this lieutenant colonel, a good friend of mine. And he's walking, he has a real long face, like a horse face. I said, what's wrong with you? And he says, oh, well, we've got Major Winters coming up. You know, we need someone to take him off our hands for dinner. <laughs> I said, you want me to do this, sir? I can't ask you to do that. You're not in our department. You're a senior officer. I said, I'll, I said, I'll take them off your hands for dinner, but you owe me one. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we had another great dinner. Well, the next day, and, and Ethel, Mrs. Winters was with him. The next day, he gave the class, and they did, and they had lunch at the club with him. And I saw this guy around, and that face was extra long. I said, no, what's wrong? I had to drive him back to Hershey because he didn't like to fly. It's about, it's about three and a half hours. I said, you want me to do that? He said, oh, I, I cannot. This time I can. I said, I'll tell you, I'm going to do it. But now you really are. <laughs> so we're driving back. And, and I'm, I'm driving. Major Winters is next to me. Mrs. Winters is in the back of the car. And she's not saying a word. It's three and a half hours. She's just knitting. We stop at a rest area uh, on uh, I-81. They get back in the car. Major Winters turns to me. He says, would you like to see my farm? I said, oh, I'd love to see your farm. So we go to the farm, and uh, he's, he's piddling around and all this kind of stuff. And I say something, uh, Mrs. Winter, I said, uh, I feel pretty honored to be able to see the farm. He goes, you ought to be honored. She says, nobody, nobody sees this farm. Tom Hanks is here. Uh, Stephen Ambrose. But nobody sees this farm. They were obviously lowering their standards. <laughs> so I go down there, and, and there's a little pond there. And here's Major Winters, and he has a bunch of breadcrumbs, and, and they have those big goldfish. And he's feeding these things. And I look at this guy, I said, this is easy company come here, jumps in a knee, and he's feeding fish. <laughs> and he's talking to them like they're, like they're his kids. Over on a fence post, there's a bunch of uh, turtle shells. I said, what's that? Ah, a couple of years ago, some snapping turtles got in, so I had to shoot them. So are you a good shot? We can't do the same thing. That his guard got real close. I'm pretty good. <laughs> so I don't know. So anyhow, we get back in the car, we go back into Hershey, and we pull up there. And for the very first time since she's been in the car, Mrs. Winter says something. She goes, how do you see out these darn windows? <laughs> of course, I'm mortified that the windows are dirty and all this. I said, I, I have no excuse. So, you know, we kind of, uh, we, we go and we talk for a while, then I go out and, uh, and I say goodbye to her, and she goes, Dick's outside. So, well, okay, you know, so I go out there, there's Major Winters with Windex, and he's cleaning. <laughs> I'm not, I am more fun. I go running out there, he says, get in, 
the old major's yelling at Colonel. So I get in, he gives me the Windex, and he goes, you do the inside. So I'm cleaning as fast as I can. He pokes his head, he pokes his head, he goes, are you doing a good job? I said, I'm trying, I'm trying. And uh, so, it a, so anyhow, uh, I remarried about uh, five years ago. And uh, I took my wife to be down to meet Major Winters. She couldn't meet my dad. Dad's in Ohio, so that's the best thing. I was going to take her to see Major and Mrs. Winters. So before we pull up to their house, I pull into the car wash. They said, I never washed my car. She said, what are you doing? I said, I've got to clean the car. She said, I thought that was kind of strange. So I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm cleaning it, and I pull out. I pull over there to the vacuum cleaner. And she goes, what, are, what is wrong with you? She goes, we're not picking up the king and queen of England. I said, Mary, we may not be. But I'm not going to have Mrs. Winter say that I have a dirty car, uh, you, know, you know, ever again. Uh, you know, the very first meeting, I, I told, uh, I mentioned something to him. I said, now, please don't misunderstand me. I said, if you ever decide to tell your own story, uh, I said, I'm not asking to do it. I'll be glad to help you in any way. And we left it at that. And it really was about, uh, it was about five years before anything came. It was almost like you, you had, you know, I almost had to prove myself. And I, and I don't mean that, uh, you know, I'm not being, you know, gratuitous in the, in the comments and everything else. Normally what happened over the years, I would stay for three hours every visit. We usually had an hour, we talked a little bit about, you know, the war experiences, we'd go out and eat, then we'd come back just to kind of BS for about an hour and everything else. Now most of my visits are limited to an hour, anywhere between a half hour and an hour, because, you know, he doesn't have the stamina, obviously, uh, anymore. Um, when Band of Brothers uh, came out in the miniseries, and of course he didn't know exactly what it was going to be, although it was based mostly on his memoirs, as was Band of Brothers. The 80% of the research, Major Winters has a file, in fact, you have a copy of them right here uh, in Ridgeway Hall. A copy of all of He had a separate file for each of uh, the soldiers in Easy Company. It was in Thanksgiving of 2003 when we came back. Uh, we stopped up there uh, in his upstairs den. He had kind of, again, his inner circle. My daughter and my daughter's there. And he passed over a, a, a paper to my daughter. And she looked at it, and he, and he did one of these. It was one of those yellow line tablets and all this kind of stuff. And he said, no, and he goes, you know, I've been thinking about something. And he took the paper, and he turned it over, and what it said is untold stories of Band of Brothers by Major Dick Winters uh, and Colonel Cole Kingsley. He goes, I'd like you to do the memoirs for me. Uh, and he goes, we're going to split everything 50-50. Uh, and so that seems a bit unfair to me. I'm thinking like 95 and 5, and I'm not talking about me with the 95. To show you what kind of man he is, I want to say it now because I don't want to forget it. Major Winters has not received a single penny from uh, his uh, memoirs. My job, which, uh, which uh, I got him to agree to, my job is the distribution of the funds. But 100% of those funds go to various charities. A lot of it goes to the, uh, at Fort Sam Houston, you know, they, they built that new wing for the amputee wing, and uh, it goes to uh, things like that, the USO, various uh, uh, religious groups, uh, and anything associated, uh, you know, particularly for our, our women, our wonderful women and men who serve in the armed, armed forces. Um, it took me about a year to get the book proposal to put together because I didn't know what a book proposal was. But I knew we had a winner on account of the, uh, the memoirs. And finally, we forwarded the book proposal the following year, the 1st of October of uh, 2004, but we already had begun uh, you know, working. And the plan at the time was we wanted to have the book completed by the 1st of April in 2006. So what I tried to do then is we broke it down into the four sections which some of you are familiar. Uh, the first section of the book kind of covered up to the time that he became a company commander. The second section of the book was the four months when he was a company commander. Uh, section three was from uh, when he became the battalion XO to the end of the war. And section four was there. So what I ended up doing is I prepared this stuff. He gave me six big uh, plastic boxes of, uh, you know, false files and everything else. And then what I would do, I did it kind of consecutively, and I passed each one of those sections back to Major Winters. At the beginning, he didn't want Mrs. Winters to take a look at it. He goes, these are my memoirs. I think he had a little bit of pressure, and, uh, and it was a good thing, because Mrs. Winters is a very good, uh, you know, editor and all that. 
The first time uh, after Section 1, uh, I, I came back down, and uh, he said something. He goes, uh, I don't cry very often, but I cried after I read each chapter. And I think what it was is because all those memories were now kind of coming back to him and everything else. I was very concerned about writing Section 2 of the book because that's the time when he was in combat as, as a company commander. And he called me up like about 9.30 at night. 83-year-old guys aren't up at, at 9.30 at night. And he called up and, and there was like a pregnant pause because I just read Section 2. And I'm kind of going like this at hand and he goes, you got it right. Then the rest of it went through there. We finished it on the 1st of April in 2005. It normally takes nine months to a year to get the thing, you know, when you submit the uh, manuscript or not. Uh, uh, all four of the leading uh, publishers in New York City uh, expressed an interest, but Penguin uh, actually accepted it. And they made an offer. On the 1st of April in 2005, I went back and told major winners, I said, we've submitted the manuscript. He goes, is there anything else I have to do? I said, no, I did. It'll be out in a month. Probably it'll be out next year. He literally was sitting in his chair, and he started, he was fading by this time, physically. His breath, a big sign goes, it's finished. And that is the last time we've talked about World War II. It's completely behind him. But it, but the, and you know what? It, it finished just in the nick of time. Because he was having a harder time concentrating uh, on some of it. Came out the next year. It was at, you know, it, I it was published the 7th of February in 2006. That happened to be the very anniversary of the day that both Major Winters and Mrs. Winters, their respective mothers, died on February 7th. And oddly enough, they both died the exact same day of the same year. And when I told Major Winters, the book's coming out in February, Mrs. Winters said, Why oh, that sounds strange. Why, why do I remember that day? But she came back over. So almost, they almost took it that this was a, a sign. You know, it, it, uh, to Major Winters' credit, it was on the New York Times bestseller list for six weeks and then on the extended bestseller list for the other uh, 13 uh, weeks. Um, and I will tell you, in, in the visits in the two years since I've seen uh, since the book has come out, it has sold over 200,000 copies. I usually like to go down there every time I'm able to tell him, you know, uh, you know how the book is doing and, and everything else. Many of you know just two weekends ago that uh, the History Channel ran the entire series again. Uh, they advertised the book. It jumped all the way back up to number seven on Barnes & Noble website uh, because of that. Uh, let me kind of tie this up uh, with some general observations uh, from my association with major winners. I've seen, I, and I've seen this many times. As a result of the war, if you are a stranger and you are introduced to Major Dick Winters, he sizes you up. Does this woman, does this man, does she, he or she have what it takes to be a leader? And if his mind the answer is no, again, he won't give you the time of day. Everybody passes, must pass a test. That's a product of the war. Uh, the reaction to the miniseries. He felt very happy about it because everybody got his due. This was not the story of major winners. It was the story of Easy Company. And as many of you know, that with Spielberg and Hanks, when they did this, they, they focused on a different soldier in Easy Company on each of those episodes. Uh, there was some resentment that he was the central figure. It's the same thing that happened with my friend Joe Dawson from the 1st Division. Uh, it, it, it not that it almost created a system in, in the, in, with the veterans of the 1st Division, but the natural reaction for those who would participate in the same campaign. You know what? There, you know, there are a couple other guys here in the 1st Division other than Joe Dawson. The odds at Omaha Beach, too, and, and they're done. And, and they're exactly right. But again, because Ambrose focused just on, on his couple uh, individuals. Uh, when, they, when they received the uh, Emmy for the best miniseries, and some of you remember that, as fate would happen, sitting in the row of that theater right in front of Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg, and uh, Dick Winters was the cast of Friends. Of course, David Schwimmer was there. <laughs> Someone tapped David Schwimmer on the shoulder, this before they announced it, and says, 
the real major winters is right behind you. <laughs> David Schwimmer turned around his major winters. I hope I wasn't too hard on you with the way that I portrayed Captain Soul. And Dick looked at him and goes, I assure you, he was much worse than you ever thought. <laughs> Uh, his most uh, treasured memento from the war. You know, you walk up in that room, you know, and anybody that likes military history, you know, every, virtually everybody, uh, every woman, every man who's ever served in the military has an I love me wall about how great we are, all our plaques and all this kind of stuff. I walked up to his office one time. Of course, there's a guide on, the original guide on from Easy Company. Uh, there were pictures of Dick with a couple of his good buddies, Colin Powell, President Bush, you know, just, just some of these guys that you know, just kind of hang around, Steve Ambrose. When Steve calls, or Tom calls, at that time, it was Stephen Ambrose or Steven Spielberg or Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks still sends him ice cream every year on his birthday, a quart of ice cream, because Dick told him one time in passing, I sure like ice cream. So Tom Hanks uh, continues doing it. But his most treasured memento was an Edelweiss. That the war was over when they were in Austria, that he, he was, they were climbing mountains, and he saw that and says, after all the horror, the terror that he had seen, that symbolized new life in spring. And most recently, his daughter took that needle device, put it under glass. Uh, but I think that says a heck of a lot about the man, the fact that that's his most treasured uh, memento. Uh, most recently, as of, I, in fact, I think it was just last month, uh, the Infantry Foundation. Uh, published a new book, coffee table book, U.S. Uh, US Army Infantry. Uh, I was privileged to do the uh, chapter on Infantry Heroes and Legends. I gave a picture of Dick Winters. And of course, you know, then they get all the smart guys around and, and, and they put all this there. And they took an, uh, a, a giant page, and, you know, it takes like 18 inches and 12 inches uh, wide of, uh, you know, the very famous, uh, you know, picture of uh, Major Winters. Uh, and Holland, and most of, I think most of you, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, know what I'm talking about. But that is uh, right there in, in, in the center of that. And at his age, that means a lot to him. That means a lot to him that you know people, uh, you know, have not forgotten. He's not talking about uh, forgetting himself, but forgetting the, but forgetting the uh, the World War II uh, generation. Um, most times I end these things with kind of a tribute, uh, you know, final tribute to the World War II generation. But I think that's what we really have already uh, uh, done tonight. Uh, I will see major winners uh, tomorrow. I guarantee you, as soon as I walk in, they'll ask me. Uh, the people turn out on account of the snow and, uh, and everything else. He's very concerned about a legacy, but it's not a personal legacy. It's a legacy of the World War II generation. That means a lot to him. Uh, he's obviously in the uh, in the winter of his life. Uh, he's a man completely at peace with himself. You know, he has a wonderful wife. Uh, you know, a wonderful family. Uh, he takes great joy that when he you know that the people, so many people, are interested in his story and the story of Easy Company.